Okay, thanks for thanks for coming, folks. You got a little bit of extra time to yourself this week, whole extra hour. Uh, but we are reading like this very long Pippa Nui. It's a very large uh, book, uh, but it's very comprehensive. I feel like looking at these materials between Maori, Hawaiian, and Mohawk, you can really get a lot of great ideas in terms of how to build a sustainable language program. Uh, I would also add uh, to the list of languages that should be studied, and, and there's lots of stuff going on all over the place. Uh, there's interesting things going on with languages that everybody, they had zero speakers, and now they're starting to make speakers, like that has happened in, in North America. Uh, but just in terms of languages that I think really have turned a corner, uh, so Hawaiian and Mohawk and Maori are sort of the three that we focus on this semester and take a look at in, in terms of kind of a case study and also a, a sample of what we might be able to do. But I would also add Ojibwe. Uh, they have lots going on with um, their language programs. Uh, they also have similar uh, boundary issues, so being both in Canada and the United States. And so that we could sort of examine what are they doing regarding the border. Uh, but they are, you know, they have an immersion school. They have a number of different things. Uh, they have a lot of camps. I was talking with some folks today about this, just continuing to think about this transition from a language we teach to a language we use to teach things through. Uh, I would also add Sami and Gaelic and Welsh to the list of languages to to examine. Hebrew, I think, would also be in there as well, just in terms of how do people do it? They had a language that was being lost and they figured out a way to hold on to it. So uh, some of them, they're building neighborhoods. Some of them, they're building you know, schools. Some of them, they're, they're building adult immersion programs. They have a variety of different ways that they're funding these things, figuring them out. So as you go forward with your language work, whether that's teaching, advocacy, administration, learning, using, whatever your role is, like. It's really helpful to look at these. So I thought maybe we would just start by talking about these three languages uh, that we've been looking at. So uh, Maori and Hawaiian and Mohawk. And what could you generally sort of say about these three language programs uh, just as an observation and things that you might find useful to what you're doing or hoping to do? We'll start there. Oh, they open the chat. Oh, yeah, Sound of Metal. Is that the one where the guy loses hearing? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it was, a, it was cool. And they go to, he goes to like an immersion um, sort of camp and learns sign language and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Just got to be thinking of his class. Yeah, I mean, there's some neat connections because he, and, and he kind of refused. Yeah, there, there was that was a good movie. It was, uh, yeah, it was good. But yeah, just in terms of like, and there's times when sign language can become a bridge, you know. So we talked about that as well, uh, and then also pushing, putting yourself into these environments. And I think one of the things that we could take from there, from that movie, is like a resistance to change because I think something that does contribute to folks. There's a lot of things that keep people from attaining high levels of fluency, but part of it could be a reluctance to change. It's like, well, I just want to keep being my same self and I want to keep doing my same stuff. But if if the language isn't there, then you can't just, I don't think you'd be the same person and do the same things. And that's not a bad thing, but it, it's just sort of, it's an interesting thing to think about just in terms of um, really being able to like communicate in a language and use it uh, with the level, with the high level, I think that's required. A lot of our languages are very complicated. You get when you get to the high level stuff, it takes a lot of effort and energy even to figure out what is going on and how to do those things. And so, yeah, interesting. I think one of the things that really stood out was, you know, there's parts where, especially when he first uh, starts losing his hearing and he ends up with at this camp is sort of the isolation of learning a language and you're, you feel so lost and intimidated around other language learners. 
and it's about creating like the community to help support each other. And so I think that really sort of jumped off the screen. I don't think, I don't know if that was their intention or not, but that's just something that popped into my head when I was watching it. Yeah. Wonderful. Anyone else? Other thoughts? Hawaiian, Maori, Mohawk. Yeah, that, that's the thing that I was thinking of as well, Duck Juice, looking at what you put in the chat, is sort of thinking about like what goes beyond the lesson. Like what is the thing that helps push this knowledge into use? And so those are some things that I think about as well. We were in Hawaii and they did the, I think I might have mentioned this, but the Aha Punanaleo, the language nest is open 11 months a year. Uh, it goes, eight, I think, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. or so. It's an all day thing. All these kids all over the place. Uh, very structured, very rigorous, very much based on Montessori methodology. And then, um, uh, but in July, they, they take the month off. And then one of those, they spend five days at a camp where all the teachers get together and do a number of different activities. And one of the activities was, that was when I first saw this, I think it's called Kahoot, maybe. So it's like a speed type of game, almost like a, you, you have these multiple choice uh, question and answers and everything's in the language. And we were learning Hawaiian at the time, and uh, there was three of us who weren't in the Hawaiian language program. So me and Deho and uh, Tinek Pangi, who's Chamorro from Guam. And we were actually hanging, we're in the top 10, like for the first like five, six questions. We're like, oh, yeah. But then it started getting like into some serious like Hawaiian language use and we just, we just dropped right out of there. But it was so, it was fun, it was interactive. And so just thinking of those things, like what are the activities and the games and how do you, I guess, how do you create this community as well, this community of learners? There's got to be this group of people who, who do the thing with like such passion and such an intensity and such fun as well that just becomes this, this thing that other folks want to do. Because for me, I find myself trying to sort of walk this line between making this the best place to be and having other people feel like they're left out of it. I was thinking about the um, community ses sessions we're supposed to be holding as a cohorts, you know, individual or together, however we do them. Um, those could be sort of like more immersive. Um, I don't know how, because like everybody's still at a distance, but uh, you know, those events could be like that, especially. And I think we have until the end of the year, right, to, to host two of them. Yeah, yeah. So thinking of these during COVID, like what, like so during the the COVID and pandemic, once everything kind of went on lockdown, I think immersions gatherings just kind of ended, and so I, I think about that too because I think well, they didn't have to. I mean, it wouldn't be the same thing to all be on Zoom again, uh, if, as I'm doing my sixth hour of Zoom today, uh, but at the same time. Y there's ways to, to be tying folks in too. And I think about this stuff and the technology aspect I think of as well. And I'm always kind of bummed out that I didn't think of it soon enough that when we had more elders and more speakers, there were plenty of times where we all got together, but we there were so many of us that the room was so big that the elders couldn't hear people talking. And so they, they didn't know how to respond. And so like we, we could have had those technologies because if you go to the College of Hawaiian Language, um, Kahakaula Oki'ilikilani has the Hale Olelo, the language house. They have this big room in there, this wonderful big room. And uh, they've got a system that they'll roll out where everybody gets a headset and then they could actively translate everything that's being said. And it was really fun to, um, to sit and to learn Hawaiian and then to watch something that was taking place in Hawaiian and then put the headphones on now and then and just see if you're generally following along. And then it was also fun because when they people spoke in English, then they would translate that into Hawaiian. So it was a two-way system. It was really fun. 
And we did do that at a language gathering in November a couple of years ago with, with Shingit. But I do think we could have used those technologies to make sure our elders could can hear if you have a conversation. Uh, because the other thing, if you have folks who are already a little shy about using the language, and then they might be just sort of kind of quiet talkers, and they stand up and start talking, and someone's like, what? I can't hear you! you know, And so then that, that gets, you know, that activates all the sweat glands and all the panic buttons and everything. And so th those are things I think about as well. But we should be planning some gatherings right now. It's got to be, if it's virtual, fine, let's do that. But then uh, in a post-pandemic, we got to figure out what those gatherings look like as well and, and start putting them back in the calendar and back into, back into action. What we did for the last one, um, is I, I keep thinking about this, uh, wherever your language is at, if you've got second language learners who are fairly advanced and you've got birth speakers who could speak at a high level, and if those birth speakers are old, then some of your critical work is keeping those two groups together and kind of uninterrupted. And so that's not to say that um, other people are less important. It's a delicate thing, but to say we've got to have these conversational spaces where we can try and get our second language learners to, to get as high a level as they can and really spend some time with these speakers before we lose them. So what we, we started doing was having one room for conversations and one room for lessons. And that's what we call them, conversations, lessons. And we said, if you want to be here, we're going to be in, in Tlingit the whole time and everybody's welcome to be here but we're not going to translate stuff for you uh, and we're not going to sort of go to the basics. But if you want to study and, and have lessons, they'll be over there on a wide variety. And we'll, we kept a calendar of who was going to teach and what they were generally going to teach. And we also said, just self-select if, if you feel like you're getting tired from sitting. Because the first time I went to an immersion thing, like I would take these naps and I would get so tired and get this such a hard headache that I wake up from a nap and I'd be like, where am I? What year is it? Like, I, I felt like I had been sleeping for like eons and I probably just had a 10 minute nap because my brain was tired because you put yourself in that situation where you can't communicate. Uh, it could be really trying. And then to build a whole school, let's build a whole school like that. Like that's, that's a huge undertaking. I mean, it can happen. Other thoughts? I feel like language exhaustion is similar to Zoom exhaustion in a way. Like, like why is this draining so much out of me? And it really shouldn't, but it like, you're completely exhausted after both of them. And then I think for this, and I, maybe it is a lack of communication. It, it is hard in the Zoom platform too, but so it's just, I bet all the other scholars that have all that double exhaustion on them from the two of it, but it's encouraging to hear that that happened to you too um, in your process, that it's just a normal thing. Cause I thought, like, is it just me? <laughs> this is hard work. And Robbie always says, oh, you guys are getting full and we just are stumbling over our words and time to do a story or something else. Yeah. yeah, I think about this as well. Like we had a dedication for a building and we danced probably, we're about six songs in and there's there's kind of just two of us who were dancing at the time. And maybe it was only three songs, I don't know. But we were dancing really hard and then uh, Nora Dauenhauer, she said, you guys had enough yet? And I said, yes. And my uncle who was older than me said, no. So we just we kept going, you know, and so that's the other thing, too, is one is, is caring for yourself and caring for each other. But then also, I do think there is this part of the decolonizing aspect of language learning where the English part of the brain just will not let go. And I think its last resort is to cause physical pain. And so you get headaches, you get exhaustion and um, that's, you know, and that's, that is the hard part. There's so many people who, who leave right before getting over that final hurdle. 
I feel like. But then maybe that's that's where we need to examine ourselves and say, what are we, what are we doing? Are, are we giving people everything they need to sort of to get there? Uh, to, and so that's that's what this program and others are seeking to do is to figure out what are those additional components we could add, um, which you know things have been interrupted by by the pandemic, but it's just stuff to keep thinking about. And yeah, it it was there was the playing it is still difficult for me. Uh, it's still I gotta think about stuff, or I'll I'll catch myself and say, why did I say it that way? I I knew it was this other way. Uh, and then also I'll forget things that I wanted to say and, and just a whole, a whole bunch of stuff that happens. But it used to be an awful lot harder than than this, you know. And so that's the thing is I used to get just kind of somewhat petrified just even thinking about going to a language thing that sometimes I just think, well, maybe I shouldn't go. Maybe I won't go. Maybe they don't even want me there. You know, just all these different voices that start popping up. Other thoughts? Something that's in all of them too is uh, using all their their old history that they have. Like uh, for us, we have who knows how many different uh, audio recordings that are transcribed and already translated, and there's no definite number on that. Like all that material should be used in classes for like us to have community events and put something together out of it. Because like the work's done, it's easier to build something off of it. But there's still that big hurdle of like clans not wanting you to use their material which but i think that's something we should that should be like something to overcome all of us yeah the the sharing of information the sharing of knowledge um there is a bit of a transition as well where a lot of the leadership whether you're looking at you know now we've got multiple forms of leadership you got the clan you've got the community you've got the tribe and the tribes you've got um the angsa corporations and now you got all kinds of leadership you got the a and b the ans and um then there's the language community and, and so like the leadership has been kind of dissected into these multiple components and what makes it complicated is if you look across the spectrum of leadership you probably find fewer and fewer speakers of the language and so that can sometimes get complicated as well where you say okay now we'll do the cultural ceremonies in our language at least but then most of the people who are running some of the ceremonies don't speak the language and so they're gonna probably resist that and so uh I've been asked at a Qui'ik to stop speaking Klinkit before, and I've been asked at a Klinkit can, clan conference to stop speaking Klinkit before. And and so, like, some of these things they, they we talked about in Hawaii, where maybe you've got to recreate older ceremonies or just create these whole other things that are the language. And so it's a bit of a balancing act. And, but I also see people kind of blaming leadership as well, saying, well, you know, so and so is the leader, but they don't even speak the language. But then I'll say, but you don't speak the language. What are you talking about? You know, and so sometimes there's a lot of blame shifting, a lot of other stuff that goes on. And so it's 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 easy to there's there's a bunch of stuff I think that's easier to do than using the language. I, I, I think making the language the language of power and use, uh, it's easier to to just not do it and do other things. It's easier to uh, to talk bad about people and what they're doing than to do the thing. But then sort of like at some point, um, you got to get that critical mass that just does the thing. Like, you know, we're just going to do the thing. And then we'll, we'll, and part of it is, you know, the metaphors are all out there. It's like, you're going to get in your boat and go, but you got to build the boat as you go. Right. And so th those are the things that you've got to do. This is Sonny. Uh responding to that, I really like this quote that came from a previous reading. And it says that it's a policy and it's from a California Indian tribe. And I'm gonna read it just for a tiny bit. It states that without the ancient language, which is our ancestral languages, we cannot exist in the manner that our creator intended. And I think a lot of our old recordings can offer us that some insight into the ways 
that we process things and understand different levels of what is around us and in our environment. So I think, you know, it would be nice if, if all that was provided and that we can and learn that. And so I agree with Herb that it would be nice to, to have access to all of that. And uh, in response to the other thing, uh, when I went to a uh, immersion program and we were there for 10 days, I noticed that when I came back, English gave me a headache. There is so much talking in the stores. Man, people speak English all the time. And in Tlingit, we were, we know, of course, you know, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't speak Tlingit, you couldn't talk. So there was a lot of quiet time, but maybe that was it. But I do think too, that sometimes we get headaches for other reasons too, other than just learning. It's just like, it's very loud. Maybe we're not used to the rhythm. There's a certain rhythm and tone and, and movement and process in our language. And, and English is, is, is more choppier. So I think it affects us differently. Yeah, right. And so that's that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it's similar as the elders used to talk to us as well, because they'd see how we're struggling and feeling bad. And they'd say, well, you know what, you just go back a couple generations, and it was the other way. Like, our ancestors had to learn English, and it was hard for them, and they struggled, and there's couldn't make certain sounds. And, and so they said, so it's okay, you know, and I think having these times to do that, and one of the big challenges that that i find is um sometimes we'll move into like these long lectures in in english about the culture and you know we need to get the culture right but if we if we say okay we're getting together for one hour in the language and if we spend 50 minutes just sort of talking in english about what we're doing wrong from perspective of the culture then i don't know if that's succeeding yet and then but these are you know, they're also difficult conversations because then I think, well, who am I to make that decision? But then at the same time, if I said, well, we came here, yeah, like I'm not going to name names. So we, we we started this project in the community in Juneau where we said, OK, we're going to have these family language gathering times. And so we set it up and we advertised it. And I went, I showed up late to, to get, you know, kids fed and everything else. I brought my kids. They're pretty small. And I, I walked in and there were no other kids there. And then um, everybody was speaking English and talking about the, the, the clans and the culture, you know, it, it was clans and clan histories and it was important stuff, but it was all in English. And so, uh, and then someone started making, making comments about how loud my kids were and, and stuff. And, um, but at the same time, it was like, it wasn't really a family activity but i can understand why folks want to share that information so then i i just sort of said in clink it i said you know my kids could hear english everywhere and this is important information but i came here so that we could be in the language and then someone uh who was much older than me said under their breath i disagree and then just kept going in english so i, I just never went back you know and so it's one of the things that is required is a cultural shift and that cultural shift to instigate it to stay strong i, I think you need a, a this critical mass of folks who are going to do that and, and that are going to be ready for when uh, an uncle comes or an auntie comes and and tries to take over the space and, and keep it from making that switch over which is which is challenging like we talk to the hawaiians a lot about how'd you guys do it? How'd you, how'd you stop the naysayers and how'd you stop these things? And how, you know, and it was, uh, I don't know. I think you gotta have that, that critical mass who's just going to do it. And then it just becomes the culture of the group. And then, yeah. Other thoughts? Um, I had a, one thing that I noticed between specifically the Hawaiian and Maoris too, is that they did a lot of work with the government. Um, you know, beyond just making it official, then they took the next step, you know, I mean, making it official language. Um, that was a huge thing they uh, proposed to legislation, um, new policies and stuff like that. And then they got the funding to support their languages or language. Um, 
And then another thing too, was that they're very clear on their strategies that, you know, the documents that we were reading. And I thought it was really awesome that they included their strategies in their own language and English. Um, I think that's huge because we can all have like a language plan, but they're probably in English. Um, so that was one big takeaway I got from it. But then also a huge part of their language programs are about the intergenerational transmission and they include the families. It's not just the eight to five school day, it's beyond that. And it's written right from the very roots of their programs into you know, how do you create language users, not just teach it in the school. So that was another big thing that I took away from a lot of the reading on those two. Yeah, and, and you, we might be at a point where we've got to write most of this stuff in English and then have little snippets here and there. But then it, it could be something where like, okay, once we build this program, once we build our, our own fluency and the group's fluency, this thing, like you want to distinctively, you, you want this document that totally comes from the thought world of the language as well, which is, which is interesting. And, and then it, like a, one, one thing I really appreciated in Hawaii was these discussions about, you know, they, they kind of just said at one point, they said, don't fear English, don't fear it. Like you, you got to figure out what those realms are going to do. Cause some, a lot of these politicians, they don't speak Hawaiian, but they're going to go make these changes that are going to make it possible for us to do all these things. The one thing that they had, which I do wish we did, is this big groups of parents that would just go protest by what looked to me like the hundreds. I don't, I don't know. They had they brought signs. They said, we're not, we're sending our kids to Hawaiian school. We're going to build that school. And, and I don't know how we motivate. I don't know how, I don't know how, I don't know how we get our people to, to draw the line like that and to not cross it and to, and to demand those changes, but but maybe our route is different. Maybe our route is a smaller route that, you know, because at the same time, I, I feel like there were attempts and there were large groups of people and there there were efforts, but in Alaska they had they could silence them more, you know, because maybe, who knows, you know, um, it's a different place. Like you know, Hawaii is, uh, it's just a different place, right? Uh, and so as, as we look at that, but how they did it, it, there's still a lot of similarities. And I think as we keep going forward, we just keep building these relationships and working with them. Because also as, as I shared problems that I've had doing this type of work, they, it seemed to me like, they said, oh yeah, we had that. Yeah, we had that. Oh, we had that too. Oh yeah, we had that. I was like, oh really? I thought we were, you know, and so that, that gave me a lot of hope to figure out like, you know, I would say one of the key things that I took from there is be strategic, be smart, and outwork everybody, you know, and, and so that's, but that's a real challenge. You know, that is a real challenge to, um, cause you get tired, you get frustrated, you, you get, sometimes you feel like, okay, this is the path. And then you start walking down the path and then trees are falling and, and the path is, it's just like, uh, you know, but these are the ways that some of these things go. And, my hope is, you know, 2050, we're sitting here and we've got these big programs, but you know, the, the biggest thing is like, nobody's going to build them. You have to build them. You have to do that. And, and to, to become that collective that, that has the, the fortitude and the courage to do something that, that we've seen to work. Um, but you know, like it, it's, it's interesting because you're going to have to stay motivated and positive and deal with some of the attacks and some of the other stuff that are going to come. But then um, the medicine is you just, you see those little kids just talking and you're like, whoa, you know? And so that that's what I continue to get from over there. So uh, Hawaii and Maori have very similar systems uh, just in terms of starting with a, a language nest and then building a, they build it basically one grade at a time. Okay, do a first grade, do a second grade, do a third grade, make more teachers, make more content, figure it out. And then 30 years later, you've got this huge program uh, where you could do your PhD totally in the language. Uh, Mohawk, on the other hand, is different. So they do have um, 
on the United States side, they have an immersion school. And then on the Canada side, they have an adult immersion program where basically you apply to go live in a house and you Mohawk is your primary language and within a year you you can speak but um, you totally live there and so it's and we'll have a chance to visit with Deho and hopefully we'll have a chance to visit with Pila and we'll be able to just ask them questions about what they saw and, and what we're experiencing and you know um, what we should do and, and all these other things it was fun because uh, Larry Kamura is really amazing. Um, but first time I met him, then I, I found his email and I wrote him. I was like, Larry, what should we do? Tell us what to do. And he's like, I don't want to tell you what to do. But then I got to know him and then we brought him over here. I was like, hey, Larry, we're going to do this. He's like, that's not going to work. Do this. You know, so then to once they get to know you, like they'll they'll give you a little bit more of that um, solid guidance. But at, at first, they're just being very polite and it was fun. He made a lot of people mad at Clinton <laughs> because they were like, well, once we get a budget, he's like, don't worry about the budget. If you think about the budget, you're not thinking about the language. You think about the money. And they're like, but we need the money. He's like, don't think about the budget. <laughs> so, it was fun. Okay. So uh, as we go through Dejo's work, he's going to explain an awful lot of language methodologies for us um, and so we're going to do an activity here but i want to say anybody else have any thoughts or comments just on these on these three programs that we're looking at yeah just real quick um i noticed that like for some of them and i'm just becoming familiar with this as as we're kind of finding the need for uh evaluation and stuff with some of the things that we're doing the uh, actual proficiency guidelines being used and um, that being uh, uh, the uh, American, what is it? American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And in talking to Dr. D'Angeli a little bit, uh, uh, she's real familiar with using that as an evaluation um, format, but it is also both for foreign languages and uh, which is the, you know, um, uh, but also too, that most of those languages that this is used for uh, has a, is an established language with a lot of resources, with a history of resources and stuff. Um, do you see a future where perhaps there is an American Council on the Teaching of Native Languages or something that would perhaps loan itself to be a unifying measure between, I mean, for Alaska, our, all our 32 languages. Part of the struggle is having these so many different uh, 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 ways of having to come in instead of a unified overall language that if something like that would be helpful in unifying a, uh, a, a struggle that covers so much ground. Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. So let me see. I was trying to find a document that I was working on. So yeah, there, well, one, there's, there's going to be some terminology that you're always going to have to sometimes just adjust because generally people aren't used to indigenous languages just being around right they, they just aren't everywhere you go and outside of uh yupik country or inuit country in northern canada uh, usually there's a fairly limited presence of indigenous languages maybe navajo uh, you know but that that stuff is changing and so for example i was in a meeting the other day and there's they kept saying world languages and um and i said you know what could we come up with a different term because Klinga language is on the world. And so if they have like world languages and indigenous languages, I don't like that. And they used to also say like modern languages. I was like, oh, we're modern. I got like a, I got an iPhone 10, you know? And so it's like just trying to sort of move so that they can create space at the table. And so foreign is another term. Like, you know, I, I don't know if I share this with you folks, but I, I got my, my voicemail is a very long thing and in, in Tlingit. And then at the end it says like, 
leave a message and then it just sort of stopped right and so um i had a plumber come by and he says i I was trying to call you, but there's some foreign language on there. And I said, oh, no, that's a native language. It's like, this is non-foreign as it gets. And he says, well, it's foreign to me. I was like, yeah, you know, but even though it's, and so maybe that needs, you know, the American Council teaching second languages, you know, and so we changed the UAS catalog. It doesn't say world languages and doesn't say modern languages. It just says non-alaskan languages right and so that's what we settled on but i i do think that there would be some work to do that um and so if we look at i guess i'll just share this with you folks this is as close as i can get right now but if we look at what does actful uh do uh, let me close that so this scale um goes through uh, novice, intermediate, advanced, superior, and distinguished. I think if you haven't created like actual advanced speakers of your language, I don't know if you can actually measure people. You could just you can tell when they are there, but you probably can't measure things above that. Um, but basically, the folks that can memorize stuff but can't make stuff, right? That that's kind of where you're at with here. Here, you can start to make stuff and do some basic conversation day to day things, but you don't understand everything. Advanced means you could pretty much interact uh, in all kinds of time frames and you do narration. You can understand most everything that even if you're not getting it sort of like maybe you're not technically 100% on in terms of how what they were referring to but you know you know exactly what they're talking about and generally what's go, what's going on getting up to these levels is you could do it all you could do all of it and so you got basically uh within here low mid high low mid high low mid high and so and then up here so you got like this 10 point scale and in this case you can have 11 I do think it's good to sort of figure out what those things kind of look like. And so did some work here, just sort of figuring out how do we know where folks are at and then basically developing about a 30 to 45 minute conversation that you can have with someone that gives you a pretty good idea of where they're at. So they move from making lists of things and responding to some really basic kind of common phrases to being able to describe things and being able to start telling you things like um, some of my examples I use for this is tell me something that makes you mad. Tell me in the language, right? And so can can you do this stuff and then to just change it a little bit so that folks aren't just sort of crafting their memorized speeches, which you start to get up here and you can actually you could be very passable by just sort of memorizing a bunch of stuff, but just in terms of like um, just you know tell me tell me what happened to you yesterday uh and then when you get into uh advanced some of the things you start getting is speculation tying things together doing a whole bunch of stuff uh, cultural and making this stuff culturally relevant as well so it's not just sort of taking something for another language and just translating that thing but it should be really so you could pull from some of the stories and um, oral his you know the histories of of clans and other things that could go into into here but it, it sort of does follow this same kind of thing so that you know doubt certainty theorizing could, could you do that you know um how did people look at the landscape and the weather and determine whether it's safe to go out on a boat could you could you talk about that could you tell me where the water goes and flush the toilet can you you know can you tell me what's going to happen if um if we cut down all the trees, what, what does that do to the animals, you know? Uh, and so these are some things. Um, and then just trying to estimate how long it might take to get to these areas. This was something I was also really interested in. So I found some sources that just sort of gave estimates. And you have some folks, they can learn a language actually just faster than other people. Um, it, but just sort of just coming up with these rough averages like I think about 8,000 hours of dedicated language time gets, gets you there, 
right? But then, and I like to use that to say, well, how many hours every single day are you working on the language? Because if you average it out, you say, okay, well, I'm taking this class uh, and then I'm practicing the same amount. Uh, I think you can get there in about six years, you know, on average. But if you could do eight hours a day, right? And so th these are some questions is how can you, how can you make that room in your life for the language, which is a big, huge, unanswered question for a lot of us um, as we try to create more you know, job opportunities to do this and uh, institutions where this happens, where the language lives, um, then that really helps. So those were some things I was uh, thinking about. And then the assessment process as well. It has to be well thought out. It has to be comfortable. It has to be pretty open. Just say, okay, if this is what we're going to ask you to do, then you go do those things and come back, see if you could do those things. Because when we first started doing assessments, like there was a room with probably 40 people in it and you sat down in a chair and there's these four big time elders and they take turns asking you questions. And I thought that was terrifying, <laughs> you know? And so I, I don't think that that's the way to do it because then it's sort of like, it's a bit of a talent show type of thing. They gotta get up in front of people. And what if you're not a performer? Or what if, you know, it's just, it's the stakes are too high. So it should be just a conversation, ideally with two people who, who are good at just sort of keeping things really comfortable and safe. And then with just that one person and just sort of, uh, just, and just keeping it, just having no big deal. If you don't know it, no big deal. We just move on to the next thing. And then doing a bit at the end, because the other thing is when people get assessed, like sometimes they can get really sad. They'd be like, I've been doing this for 15 years. How come I'm right here? Maybe I should just quit. But then what you got to do is you say, we're just going to shine a light and say, there's lots of ways to get there. But we, what we suggest is you start studying these things and these things, learn how to do this. And then once you go get those things, here's these other things you do, but we can tell you about them later. But the other thing too, is if, if you can implement this, I think it's important. I think the other important thing is in, in Southeast Alaska, anyways, we're status people. Like, you know, like, how come they give the intermediate people like a badge or a blanket or some leather jackets and just, you know, like celebrate them, really celebrate what's going on because we have people who are shifting their whole life to make sure that these languages survive and thrive. And I think make it the coolest thing to do and uh, give them something awesome, man. Yeah, that's uh that's really uh if i could get i don't know if the uh documents that you just showed were available uh or if i could get them through email or anything like that but that's that's exactly what i'm what i was talking about right there so yeah and and fully agree uh there should be uh uh such celebration i mean i i feel like it should be celebrated like sports i mean that's a but, you know, I, if if you've ever been around a championship team, <laughs> they 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 get away with some shit. <laughs> uh, classes classes get a little yeah. I don't know. I'm not saying give people breaks, but uh, but if they uh, had a celebrated status uh, where we're throwing feasts for our black belts and you know, blankets for our red belts. And you know what I mean? I, I just, I would love to see that and, and hope to help uh, celebrate that stuff in the future for sure. Yeah. And, and I, I think that, that that is something we got to figure out. Um, all, all the images and everything is in, uh, it's in my dissertation. If you guys want to, to get it, uh, I put it in our class Google folder under um, additional readings, I think. And then if you go to Currently, I think clinkitlanguage.com and there's a section for language revitalization that it's on there. But uh, yeah, and, and it'd be good to, to some of the next steps as well is we could bring Deho and, and others here to have specific workshops with us to develop this stuff for our languages. And th there are going to be some naysayers out there who are going to be like, who are you? Who are you to say who's who's what level? Right. But it's just sort of like, OK, 
it's got to start, right? We've got to be able to know where people are. And you, and you also kind of for your, it's, it's a little sensitive, but I think you got to do this for some of your existing birth speakers as well. So that you say, okay, well, here's these wonderful speakers, but you can't go to them with these super hard, like grammar questions, because they're not going to be able to, they might not be able to answer it. They could talk, but they're not, might not be able to do that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, there's something that I was thinking about, like um, all of us, you know, working towards being teachers. I mean, if we were able to work with teachers who are like developing curriculum or whatever, and you know, where they need that help is like, <clears throat> say they have a book all about letters, you know, in Tlingit. They could probably use a hand, like how else can we make this same book that way kids in like this grade have everything throughout the year to just practice that and then the next grade up how else are we going to make that better for them because you have to have like yao you know how many letters in Tlingit are in yao you know just people in general yeah like you know how many people in general know that and then where's the thing that's like a test to to practice that to write it out to sound what's the second sound in there like those kind of things that are in some of the readings and some of like what our kids get sent home, um, the same kind of material. And um, I think just more like if we were to work more with other people, I'm just, I know it's hard now, especially because everybody's super busy, <laughs> but I think it would help more to be a part of, you know, a bigger part rather than this group and this group and this group. Like it's gotta be some time where we all come together and how can we help the people who are already teaching and then maybe they can help us get to where they are because I've, I've taken a lot of that material and for like developing this Yalk curriculum I have it to where it's like 10 pages deep and I, I know what I need to add to it to be able to apply it to different grade levels but there's only so much time in a day and may, you know getting there it's really hard but it's like a future goal yeah right and, and so a lot of this is coordination, right? And then also figuring out like, what's the next thing? And, and with this methods and materials, like a, a big part of it, and we're gonna do a few activities um, before we're done here is, how do you keep track of everything you've got? And how do you make sure you're filling the needs of, of what's there? And one of the things that um, uh, Nila Toga put in the chat that's, uh, that the Mohawk have is something that there's a group in, in based out of Atlin, and a lot of them are in Whitehorse right now, and they're developing language materials as well that base around these central stories. And what's really neat is they sort of boiled down some of these, because whenever you get into the stories in our languages, they're usually they're big, they're complicated, and that's what they should be. But then I think you got to make some sort of the the essential versions, like the 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 vinegar that gets sort of boiled down to this real condensed version, right? I, I don't know how we think of it, but like it's essentially like kind of a kid's version, right? And we don't want to insult anybody, but you, we're, we do, I do this a lot. Like, let's look at this story. And then it's like super complicated. Everything in there is complicated. The, the concepts, the language, the grammar, like everything is complicated. So maybe like doing some smaller versions and then building up to the bigger versions of these stories and having people memorize them and having people reenact them and, and doing lots of stuff to to really internalize this stuff so that that you've mastered that story and then when you hear this longer complicated version you like then your brain's just trying to put together these extra pieces because it already knows what's there and so i, I do think that's one of the things uh, one of my colleagues, his name is Shkuyi, he really wants to build a set of speeches and stories that are foundational to language teaching. And so that for some people, they might get frustrated because like, I want something new, I want something new. But sort of like, you have to master this. And so moving towards like the mastery of something, the application of it, and then, you know, for example, like if you're bored of this story, stand up and tell it to me in the language. And then maybe we can move on to something else. And so that that's the point. And so, yeah. So uh, what we're gonna do, so keep grinding through this book. It's, it's a lot, but this is a, a 
great scholar and, and also uh, something is I think the Hawaiian used the Montessori method of education, especially early childhood education. It's a Montessori program. And that's a whole educational philosophy. So some of the things like they're doing literacy at a very early age, the kids are writing letters, the kids are making all the sounds, uh, the kids all have a responsibility. Like a one of, you know, I don't, I don't teach this stuff. I don't know this stuff very well, but it seems to me Montessori is very much like day to day life these kids are going to be ready to operate in a home. A school is essentially a home. Everybody has chores. Everybody has their responsibilities. Everybody takes a turn leading the classroom. And then the Waldorf method is something that the Mohawk are using in their early childhood education. And that is generally like, it's a lot more visual audio learning. We do lots of uh, songs and sounds and activities and we're very conscious of the physical body and crossing these planes and having uh, motions as we do things. But also, like, we're not going to teach them to read and write until they're around the fourth grade. And we're, we're not going to expect them to paint in the numbers and to draw specific things. But we're going to have them do very, like, let them find their way. So the Montessori system works for Hawaiian culture because they are very much about the kumu and you do everything the teacher says and it seems like folks that were talking to me about mohawk were like we just we do what we want we don't tell other people what to do we figure it out and then we sort of go and so the other thing is trying to figure out these these basic educational philosophies that seem to match the culture of your peoples and those are interesting things because um some of the dialogue that we had with uh, Hawaiian folks and also with uh, Mohawk folks. Well, it was just fascinating to see how you could build a language program that really seems to fit. And so that's the thing is like, don't change your culture to fit the program, but build the program so that it accommodates and is based out of and born from your culture. Although every culture has aspects that will need to change. Every language has things that will need to change as well. You want to make sure you're preserving and you're maintaining those old ways of talking, that high form of grammar. But, you know, don't let people shut you down. If, if folks want to talk about video games, if folks want to talk about you know, intimacy or, or whatever the things are, there's a whole bunch of realms where I felt like our language was kind of banished from those realms. And, and then you were, the result is you'll maybe go to an elder and say like, Hey, I'm raising my kid. I need to say, wipe your butt in, in the language. And, and they'll say, we don't say that in our language. I'm like, but we did it, right? How, didn't we tell people to do it and teach them how to? There's a bunch of stuff you got to teach. You got to teach kids everything, right? So, yeah. So, uh, again, coming back, we're going to, Wednesday, we're also going to start some Google documents. What are these? What are these things we're going to create? You're going to create a curriculum plan for a language. And, and that doesn't mean like whatever we end up with, we end up with. We're going to do everything that we can between now and then. Um, maybe dividing some of this work, figuring out what to do, making sure that we're all pulling our weight. We, we want to be like a canoe, right? A canoe, everybody's paddling. We want anybody just this is Raven's story where he's like, okay, well, I'll hold this berry basket so it's safe. And you guys paddle. We don't want anybody doing those kind of tricky things. Like everybody's going to pull their weight or else this canoe is going to, we'll feel it turning the other way because we've got a bunch of weak paddlers on one side. Okay. Thanks for being flexible this week, folks. Uh, power through this reading. Uh, what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to do a little interactive activity first, mapping out. Uh, what I want you to do is just do a little bit of thinking. What are all the different groups of people that you think we should be teaching the language to? And then within those groups, you know, for example, grade schoolers elementary you know like 
maybe it's age groups, but maybe it's just sort of folks. Like we, we might have people who are uh, who who live somewhere else, but they're from here. We want to make sure they have access to the language. And then we're going to figure out like what are the methods we can use to teach those groups, and what are the materials that we should be developing or have to teach those groups. Yeah, we have a lot. I just got an email today about someone who's in jail for murder and they, they had some cultural questions about it. I, I had someone else who was reaching out and says, I want to learn Clinkit, but I'm, I got a life sentence and I am Clinkit, but I, I can't have any material sent to me. I was like, oh man, I don't, I feel like I let them down, but we need to have an answer for all of that. We got all kinds of people out there been taken by these systems, adopted, jails. These are all systems that are kind of designed to break our people down. So we got to be able to like reach everybody. So think about that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll start Wednesday with that. And then we'll also talk about this stuff when I'll let you know when, when Deho might be able to come visit us. Okay, thanks a lot, folks. We'll see you on Wednesday at 3. Nice to see you.